We're going to turn our hearts to the word of the Lord. And if you turn in your scripture to Mark 16, Mark 16. Though he rose in history, everything he does isn't in history. (laughs) Some of it is still happening. Some of it will happen this morning. Amen. If you would, as our custom, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? We'll read three verses of this resurrection story. And right before we read, I've, I've um, interrupted the story where the, the uh, subjects aren't named, but the, the principal subjects of this story are the women who had observed where Jesus had been buried. And now they're returning to the place where they observed he had been put into the grave. And that's where we interrupt the story. Verse 2. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, here's the question. Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. I want to preach this morning in reference to this, but I want to preach God still moves stones. God still moves stones. Who will move the stone was the question. But God had already answered it because He moved it away. God bless you. You can be seated. Your observations may be different than mine, but I have noted one of the modern feats of engineering and architecture. I'm going to tell you what it is. Have you noticed any more when they build a new shopping center or big box store, you can't find your way into the parking lot and you can't find your way out of the parking lot? How many's noticed that? Let's play maze, you know. I mean, you start to go and there's a curb or there's an arrow or there's a turn or there's a sign or there's a landscaping plant bed and and you you just uh, you just start want to start hopping curbs everywhere you go there seems to be an obstruction of getting where you want to get john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son listen that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me tell you something I believe. Every person born, whether they realize it or not, every person born, when they come to a time that they're self-conscious and can make decisions, two things are happening in their lives. Number one, God is at work in their life to bring them to the place that they might believe in Jesus Christ and be rescued from eternal perishing. I believe we serve that God. He works on people to bring them to the place of believing. But the other force at work in people's life is the enemy of our souls, Satan. And he keeps trying to put obstructions and hindrances, and barriers, and blockades in a person's path so they cannot come to that place where they can believe on Jesus and be saved. I want you to tell you that that may be the case, but in the story of the resurrection, just like God moved that literal stone that stood between this group of women followers and their believing the life-changing message about Jesus and their being saved, just like He moved that literal stone. Our God is in the business of moving that stone that stands in a person's way that keeps Him from believing that 
keeps him from being saved, that keeps him from experiencing eternal life, that keeps him from hope, that keeps him from peace. I'm telling you, our God is in the business of removing the obstruction. And I believe right here in this place this morning, if somebody would let him, he'd move the stone. You'd see the way. You'd be able to walk the way. You'd be able to come to Jesus. You'd be able to come to life. Amen. Because our God still moves stones. Can you say amen? If you're here this morning, you've not found salvation. If you've not found something to fill the emptiness of your heart on the inside. If you have no hope for tomorrow, I want you to take this true story as an example that for you too, God will remove the stone that you can enter in to a life-changing experience. Oh, can you say amen? The corpse of the one they called Jesus hanged upon the cross that they'd used to execute Him. He was proved dead by the soldier's spear that ripped through His abdomen and pierced His heart. It was growing dark when a secret follower of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, actually a member of the Sanhedrin, though he had had no part in their trumping up the charges and falsely accusing the Lord and sentencing Him to death. When it grew dark, Joseph of Arimathea went to the governor and begged permission to take down the body of Jesus and to bury Him. The permission was granted by Pilate, and Joseph, with the help of his soldiers, knocked loose the spikes that held Christ's fashion. I don't know if they used a hammer. They had to wiggle them, something we've not oft thought about. But Joseph and his servants had to wiggle loose the spikes. And then they gently lowered Christ to loving hands. They wrapped the body of Christ. And Joseph had a comrade in this, Nicodemus, another secret follower of Jews. He came and together they wrapped the body of Christ with spices. And then since Jesus had no grave, Joseph, his newly hewn grave, not quite finished, had his servants lay the body of Christ there in his own tomb. Once the body lay upon the burial shelf within that tomb, if you'll note in the Scripture it said, and they rolled a stone upon the door of the sepulcher. It was not quite finished. The tomb, we can tell that because normally tombs were fitted with doors. There had been no time to fit it with doors, so they looked around and found the most massive stone they could. No doubt took the joint effort of both the servants of Joseph of Arimathea and the servants of Nicodemus to move it. But they positioned that stone until it closed the mouth of, of the new grave. Matthew notes that it was a great stone, or literally a mega stone. A mega stone. I'm preaching to someone this morning, you have mega things in your life. You have mega problems. You have mega doubts that keep you from getting to Jesus and from being saved. And I want to emphasize that this stone too was a great stone. God is already doubt-proofing Jesus' death and resurrection. The tomb, Scripture says, was hewn out of rock. There was one, only one interest, entrance blocked by a stone being hewn out of rock. There's no way to dig in to that grave from its back or its sides. Amen. The Jewish leaders that had killed Jesus amen, went to the governor, the chief priests and Pharisees and Sanhedrin members and said to the governor, we remember how this man said that he would rise again and so that those disciples or someone won't come and steal the body and spread the rumor that he has risen and the trouble we have be greater in the end than it is, is even now. Could we have a watch of soldiers to watch the tomb? And Pilate gave them permission. He gave them leave with these words. Make it as sure as you can. 
can. Amen. Make it. Make sure nobody gets in. Make sure nobody can come to Jesus. Amen. The Jewish leaders left with the sentries and the watch of men. And they came to the tomb and sealed it with the seal of government. And then they stationed the sentries round about to watch for any who might come to that tomb. Make it as sure as you can. And they did. Nobody's getting to Jesus. We've got every obstruction possible in the way. Could I tell you there's another enemy. He does everything he can. He makes us as sure as he can that nobody can get to Jesus. You may be here and I want you to believe this if you've not yet come to Jesus as the Savior of your soul. The enemy of your soul has made you as sure as he can with every type of obstruction and hindrance and barrier between you and the Lord. Make it as sure as you can. I want you to know as I tell this story this morning, the stone kept these women from getting to Jesus. It kept them from getting to Jesus. As they had taken Jesus from the cross, the women paid particular attention. Where in the graveyard that they had laid our Savior. They went home that evening filled with grief. But as they returned to the city, they were not idle. They began to gather together spices and ointments and perfume. And they said, we know that tomorrow is the Sabbath. But as soon as the Sabbath is over, on the next day, we will go to the tomb and we'll anoint our precious Lord, our precious Savior. They waited all that day, all day that day for the Sabbath. But the thing during the wait that perplexed him was a problem. The scripture shares it in Mark 16. The problem was who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? I want to tell you that Sabbath was a long Sabbath. Not just for their grief, but for their anxiety, the disturbance of their mind. We want to go to Jesus, but there's something in our way. It's too big for us. It's too great for us. How will we move the stone? You see, that stone wasn't just keeping those ladies from the body of Jesus to perform it. That stone was a barrier to their very believing in Jesus. It kept them from getting to Jesus, not just his dead corpse of a body, but that stone stood in their way from from their getting to the one, the living Jesus, who they had not yet come to know that he had risen again. The stone was in their path. I want you to know this, this morning, if you don't know Christ as Savior, there are things in your life that keep you from coming to him. Maybe it's just things that happen to you in life. Maybe it's choices you have made, consequences of sin. Maybe it's a hurt in your heart. Even Maybe it's doubt and fear and unbelief. Maybe you've been abused. You've been betrayed. You've been done wrong. You've seen a few hypocrites around. I don't know what it is, but you've not come because something is in your way. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a fear. Maybe it's a secret sin. Oh, but I want to tell you, when God got ready to move that stone, hear me, I said when God got ready to move the stone, the governor's seal couldn't keep it from moving. Amen. The guard of sentries couldn't keep it from moving. Its colossal weight couldn't keep it from moving. Its large size couldn't keep it from moving. When God got ready to move the stone, he moved it out of the way. You may think you can't come to Jesus, but I'm preaching. He still moves the stone. And whatever's in your way of coming to Jesus, if you'll let him, if you'll start coming to him like the ladies did, he'll move it out of the way and you can come to Jesus as Lord. I said as living Lord, as Savior of mankind. How many believes he still moves the stone? Well, we just worship him. Hallelujah. The 
the ladies chose to come even though they knew something was in the way. And seeing their coming, the Lord moved the stone. Look at verse 4. And when they looked, their minds burdened down, disturbed, wringing their hands. How are we going to get to Him? But when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away. The last time they'd looked and been there, the stone was in the way. But now when they look, it's been moved. The tomb is wide open. Amen. I want to make very strongly an important fact. The stone was never moved to let Jesus out. He had already come up right through those grave clothes. Right through that solid rock roof. He had already went right through it. That stone was never moved to let Jesus out. That stone was moved to let the ladies in. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He'll move the stone for you so you can come to Jesus. Whatever your life has been, whatever hang-ups you've developed, whatever problems perplex you of mind and heart and soul, amen, whatever relationships have been spoiled, amen, whatever disappointments you've had, amen, if you'll just as those ladies head in His direction, He'll move the barrier. You can come to His feet as Mary did. Oh, Oh, Master, Master, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. The stone had been moved. I wanted to note that normally they put a stone at the door of a tomb to keep the living from getting at the dead. This time they put the stone there to keep the dead from getting to the living. Because make no mistake, before we come to Jesus, we are dead in trespasses and sin. And let me tell you why the enemy puts the stone there to keep you from getting to the living. He's the living one. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't you feel like those, for a lot of reasons, we won't discuss, but those centuries felt very silly before the day was over with. They'd been guarding an empty tomb. <laughs> hallelujah. The stone kept them from getting G to Jesus. The stone kept them from getting the message. Now notice, without hesitation, when the women saw that the stone was moved, they walked right into the tomb. And it took a minute for them to comprehend. We shouldn't be able to see in here. It's early morning and the shadows should make it dark in here. But why can we see in here? And then they realized the reason they could see in the tomb that was supposed to be dark. There were two angels with garments and countenance shining with the glory and brightness of God and lighting up the tomb. Why? Amen. So that the ladies could see the tomb had been vacated. Hallelujah. And the angels turned to them and said, fear not. And then in Luke, the angels said to them, why seek ye the living among the dead? You go to the cemetery if you go there because of somebody's dead. If you want to see somebody's alive, you don't go to the cemetery. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, for He is risen. As He said, come and see the place where He laid. I'll tell you where that stone was there. It's so that those ladies would never hear that message. I'll tell you why the enemy puts stones and barriers in your path. It's so you can't hear that Jesus loves you. So you can't hear there's a way to be forgiven from the weight of sin. So you can't hear that you can be delivered delivered and set free so you can hear that Jesus is deliverer and savior and so you can hear there is hope in a hopeless world there is light in your darkness amen that's why the stone's been put there but he rolled the stone away so the ladies could hear the message he is not here he is alive and he'll move the stone this morning so you can personally hear the message Jesus died for you to give you eternal life Lord. 
I want you to notice the simple truth. Had the women not came seeking, the stone would have not been moved. If the women had not come seeking, the stone would not have been moved. If the stone had not been moved, the ladies would have never gotten into the tomb. And had the ladies not gotten into the tomb, they had never heard the good news. He's alive. That's the purpose of the stone. I said, that's the purpose of the stone. He doesn't want you to come to Jesus. And when you come, He certainly doesn't want you to hear the message. There's hope. There's a Savior. There's a Deliverer. There's one who can wash your sins away. There's one that can give you hope of eternal life. Oh, there's hope. Oh, how so many need to hear it this morning. There is one that can deliver you. He can set you free. He can bring peace and hope. He doesn't want you to hear that. The enemy of our soul. But remember this message. God still moves stones. Oh, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. You may not even realize that it's Jesus you're seeking this morning. You may not even think and make the connection. But you do know you're seeking for something to feel the emptiness, something to give you a purpose in living, something to rid you of shame and guilt. And whether you recognize that's Jesus or not, let me tell you, that is Jesus that you're seeking. Oh, the madness in our world, if they'd only realize it, it's a search for Jesus. Hallelujah. And then last of all, I want you to notice not only did the stone keep them from Jesus and keep them from getting the message, but the stone kept them from a changed life. They had put their hopes and dreams in Jesus. And when the Romans took and killed him, their dreams were dashed, their hopes died. They had attached they had attached their lives and their future and their plans and their affections to Jesus. But now Jesus has been killed and buried. And when they buried Jesus in that tomb, those ladies' hopes and dreams and plans and future and feelings of joy were buried with Him. Buried with Him. Oh, hallelujah. You may be here this morning and long ago you buried any hope you buried any joy you buried any reason to keep on living I know what I'm talking about all across our land people are in this place they've buried it I said they've buried it they have no reason to go on they have no purpose of living life it's been dead and buried and those ladies dreams were buried with Jesus but now it's all different because Jesus is alive. I want you to notice something at the message of the angel that in a moment they went from heavy hearts. In a moment they went from disturbed minds. In a moment they went from darkness when they got the news he's alive. In a moment they went to joy. They went to peace. They went to rejoicing. They went to hope. In a moment I'm telling you he'll still move the stone. Why? so you can have a changed life you come to Jesus sincerely repent of your sin and in a moment you can go from death unto life you can go from sin into a pure and a clean heart and mind you can go from darkness to light hallelujah how many believes he can change your life look what it says in Matthew and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' words. That fear wasn't the fear of hopelessness. That fear was being stricken with wonder and awe and amazement. I mean, a power to raise a man from the dead. And bring him out of a closed tomb. That's a power to reverence. That's that fear. They might have had hopeless fear. But now it's not hopeless fear. It's wonder. Anyone feel that this morning? What a mighty God we serve. 
Oh, and great joy. I'm telling you, their lives were forever changed. Their hearts had been changed. And when their hearts had been changed, their future was changed. How will you notice something? They came with empty hearts to an empty tomb and left with full hearts. <laughs> How that happened? Oh, because he lives. That's how that happens. I want to tell you it happens that way today. You can come from an empty life. You can come from an empty home. You can come with an empty heart this morning to an empty tomb. And you can leave full, full of purpose, full of joy, full of love, full of hope. Oh, hallelujah. How many can say this morning, I came to him empty. And at the empty tomb, I found the risen Lord, and I left with my heart overflowing. Hallelujah. Would you come, music? If you're here without Christ this morning, Jesus died for your sins as well as mine. He suffered for your sins as well as mine. Why? Because He took our punishment. So we wouldn't have to spend eternity in hell. He took our punishment so we could go free. We could believe in Jesus and have eternal life. He rose again so that when we die, we can enter in to paradise, to heaven with Him. And He did it so that today your life could be forever changed. Please, please hear this. I'm not preaching fantasy. I'm not preaching made up. This is history. This is real. If you look around, you'll see testimonies all over this building of people who have come. And God has moved aside every stone, every barrier of belief. And they have found Jesus as Savior and Lord and giver of life. I could tell different illustrations this morning. And though I've shared it several times, I couldn't keep from thinking of a good friend of mine. He's been pastoring for 30-some years now. And he wasn't raised in a godly home, knew hardly anything about Jesus, knew hardly anything about God. In his teenage years, he began to live a promiscuous lifestyle, drinking and drugs and partying and wickedness. But his heart was empty, and he was at a party, and the atmosphere, the room was filled with marijuana smoke, smoke and all, all, all the way around him. There were folks tripped out, messed up. But that home, just as a vestige, just a leftover from another time, had one of those big old family Bibles on the coffee table. And in His Highness, He walked over there and He opened up that Bible and He began to read. And as He began to read from the Bible, He heard the voice of God. I'll save you right here if you'll believe. I'll save you right here. I want to tell you that's not a good place to get saved. That's an unimaginable way. To, but I'll tell you what happened. He went to that party and there were all kinds of stones in the way. There was a stone of not being raised right. There was a stone of his past and his wickedness. There was a stone that that was a party. There was the stone that he was stoned. Amen. That was a stone. Amen. All kinds of stones in his way. And the stone, he didn't know much about the Lord. He didn't know much about Christ. I'm telling there's all kinds of stones. Oh, hallelujah. But something in his heart said, I'd like to come to Jesus. And when God saw that, he reached down and started taking those stones out of the way. And right there at a drug party, my friend found the Lord Jesus Christ. He found that he lives. You're here this morning. I don't know what stones block your path to Jesus. But I'll tell you, if you'll start taking those steps toward him, I promise you, he'll move the stones. Would you stand this morning across the building? I want you to believe me today. He still moves stones. Would you, if you're here, would you all over the building? Would you bow your heads just for a moment? Hallelujah. You're here this morning. You need Jesus. You know what your life is a mess. Maybe you've not even admitted it, conceded it yet. But you're hopeless. You have no sense of purpose 
It's all emptiness. Oh, you need a Savior. That's why He came to die. He came to die so you don't have to live that way without hope, without meaning, without purpose, without joy. You say, you know, you know, I've heard some about that. I'd like to be saved. I'd like to know I have eternal life. I'd like to have my sins forgiven. But what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And you don't know what I've done. And you don't know what's been done to me. And you don't know what I wrestle with. I want to tell you, if you really want to come to Jesus, just start coming. And He'll start moving stones. Hallelujah. Church, would you pray across this building that God would draw by His Spirit. All across the building, church, would you pray? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to invite you right now to begin to come. Put very simply, you would say, I need Jesus. I need help. I need hope. Amen. Would you begin to come right now? We use these steps across the front as a place to kneel and encounter God. And if you would come and kneel at one of these steps, there would be folks from the church immediately with you that would pray with you. Amen. You need Jesus. God bless you that are coming. Are there others? You need Jesus. You need Jesus. I mean, don't hesitate. He'll move the stone. He'll move. Just kneel right down here. Folks will pray with you. Hallelujah. 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 Are there others? You need Jesus this morning. You need Jesus. You need Christ. Don't hesitate. Right now, as I'm giving you an invitation to come, you're looking at the stone. You're thinking, what about this? I face this. I think this. I struggle with this. He'll move that stone if you'll start coming. Hallelujah. You need Jesus. Would you come? Don't hesitate, young. As I preach to my heart, just that someone young here is in such desperate need and loneliness and, and lostness this morning. Someone young, you need Jesus. Would you come? Amen. He'll move the stone out of your path. Hallelujah. Are there others you'd like to come? Amen. Would you like to come this morning? You need Jesus. I want to tell you, there's no other message that can change your life. He's the living Lord that forgives us our sins and gives us eternal life. Hallelujah. You need Him. Would you come? Some of you have heard the story many, many times. And when you feel the Spirit tugging at your heart, you point at the stone and say, but I was hurt. Or you point at the stone and say, well, I, I know some people are supposed to be Christians and they're hypocrites. Or you point at the stone and say, you don't know how I was abused. And I don't minimize that. I'm just telling you, if you really want eternal life, come to Jesus and God will move the stone. Hallelujah. Anyone else you'd like to come and join these that are praying? Would you like to come? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to invite everybody to come now. And if you need the Lord, you just come as folks are coming and somebody will pray with you. Amen. Come on, you need the Lord. Don't hesitate. Other folks are coming. Just, just join them. Just slip into the aisle with them. Amen. If the front fills up, we'll make a place. We'll make a place for you to pray this morning. Amen. Would you come and fill these altars? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Call upon His name. You need Him. Don't let that thing keep you from Jesus. Oh, He still changes hearts that will pray. If you found my sins prison, you don't have to stay. For He still rolls the stone away. Let Him move the stone. Don't walk away without encountering Christ. Let him move the stone. Let him move the stone. He still changes heart that will break. If you're bound by sin's prison, you don't have to stay for he still Oh, he still rose.
change your heart. He'll change your heart. If you're bound by sin's prison, you don't have to stay. For he's still oh, yes, the stone. Lord. Yes, Lord. He'll roll the stone. Hallelujah. 